My Lords, Today we shall discuss the history of humanity within our galaxy to date. We shall cover the Ulysses Initiative, i.e. the launching of great arc ships and subsequent founding of the Commonwealth of Man. We shall discuss the fallout and turmoil on Earth and eventual founding of the United Nations of Earth following humanity's first faster than light flight. And finally we shall touch on two major events in the Commonwealth and United Nations post-FTL histories. Humanity's attempts at space travel have a long and storied history. Ever since ancient times, people have gazed up at the night sky and dreamed of venturing beyond the bounds of Earth. Over the centuries, these dreams have inspired countless writers, artists and scientists to explore the possibilities of space travel. It wasn't until the 20th century, however, that space travel became a real possibility. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, into orbit around the Earth. This marked the beginning of the space age, a time of rapid technological advancement and exploration. In 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to travel into space, making a 108-minute orbit around the Earth. This achievement was soon followed by the United States' own space program, which included the first manned moon landing by astronauts, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin in 1969. Several decades of spaceflight continued until the beginning of the 21st century, where due to rising costs, a number of fatal accidents, and ultimately coming down to politics, meant that spaceflight was put on hold. For a time, it appeared that the individual states who occupied the Earth back then were less interested in reaching for the stars, and it seemed private corporations would surpass them. It is not entirely clear what changed or why, but midway through the 21st century there was a cultural shift on Earth. It seemed humanity longed for the stars once again. A generation born too late to explore the Earth, but too soon to explore space, would leave their children and grandchildren a great gift. The 193 states making up the United Nations came together for the first time in many decades, and made a choice to attempt something truly wonderful. They were going to make spaceflight a possibility again, and humanity would explore the stars. Thus began the Ulysses Initiative. In the year 2048, the project would be to date the greatest undertaking of humanity. Six wonderful arc ships were built in low Earth orbit over the next 50 years. They would house a quarter of a million colonists each, men and women who volunteered to explore the stars. Alpha Centauri would be the target destination. All six ships would travel together. The journey was estimated to take approximately 108 years, and as such, the crew and colonists would be put in cryostasis for the duration. As you well know, my lords, we did not ever reach Alpha Centauri. It is not entirely clear exactly what happened, but according to fragmented ship logs, as we passed into the Oort cloud at the edge of our solar system, it seems we hit some sort of space-time anomaly, possibly a wormhole, that would forever change our fate. The wormhole, if indeed that's what it was, spit us out into the system that we now call Deneb. Our ship carried the designation Chrysanthium, and you can still visit it at the Museum of Ancient Relics in Unity's capital city, Radica. The crew were awakened by the onboard ship's computer, and managed to crash land on the moon of a large gas giant, and thus humanity had found its second home that they would come to call Unity. The remaining five arc ships were nowhere to be seen and the 250,000 colonists on the Chrysanthium were alone. Or at least that's what they initially thought. The moon that humanity had been so abruptly forced upon was already occupied by an Iron Age reptilian race, who despite initial attempts to communicate with were immediately hostile and were estimated to number in the millions. The Krokak, as they quickly became named, were undeniably aggressive. They initially swarmed the crash Crathansium, which miraculously had not suffered any hull breaches, thus providing humanity with the protection it sorely needed. It's worthy of note, my lords, that this was humanity's first contact with extraterrestrial life. Never before had humanity come into contact with the alien, and this first contact would shape what would become the Commonwealth of Man. The Krokak's inability to break through the hull of the Chrysanthium allowed the ship's military defence force to secure an appropriately chosen airlock that would serve as a defensive position, should the Krokak be hostile, as indeed they were. Upon opening the airlock, the Krokak streamed in. 
They were roughly two meters tall, consisting of solid frames of muscle, sinew and scales. Their warriors wielded curved blades, which were razor sharp. The airlock, however, provided a fantastic choke point. The aliens were large enough that realistically only one or two were able to climb through at once. And when it became apparent that they were obviously hostile, it was little challenge for the defense force to hold them back with small arms fire. This incident sparked a decade of total war, slowly eroding humanity's once relatively curious, egalitarian and xenophilic traits into those of a xenophobic militarist. The Krokak did not stop in their ultimately pointless attacks and raids. The colonists aboard the Chrysanthemum slowly expanded, initially fortifying a two kilometer square perimeter around the crash vessel, before over the years pushing out across the entire moon, slowly purging the reptilian species who had once lived there. Within 20 Terran years, the sole sapient species on the moon was human. Back on Earth, the fate of the six art ships remained uncertain, but it was widely reported that all had been destroyed when they did not reappear from the Oort cloud at the edge of our solar system. What was supposed to be humanity's greatest achievement, and represented a coming together between individual nation states, quickly began to turn sour. The next 50 years of history for the humans living on Earth would also prove to be difficult, but war was somehow avoided. And the UN began to gradually regain support, and slowly expand, until by the start of the 22nd century, the international organization had become a de facto world government. The next 100 years or so were the absolute peak of human advancement. Space travel was still the ultimate goal, and the tragedy of the Ulysses Initiative was placed to one side. Throughout the 22nd century, humanity began to explore its own solar system, building observational posts and mining facilities over Mars, Venus, and a number of Jupiter's moons. Though there were some who resented the power the UN wielded, as evidenced by the maturation police action of 88, few could deny the technological progression and perhaps more importantly, humanity was beginning to view itself as just that, humanity, instead of individual nationalistic nation states. It had taken several millennia, but humanity was about to finally put aside its differences and reach for a greater ideal. In the late 22nd century, the science vessel Odyssey while surveying the very edge of the solar system, near the Oort cloud where the six Ark ships were lost, discovered something that would forever change humanity's fate among the stars. Scanners picked up undercurrents of antiprotons, flowing in a singular, precise direction, almost as if shaped or designed to do so. The wave pointed directly towards Alpha Centauri, the solar system's nearest star. It remained unclear whether the phenomenon was naturally occurring, but Earth scientists believed they could build a piece of technology that would allow them to ride this wave of energy. Thus, a special project to build the first hyperdrive was put underway. With the full backing of humanity, the project was completed swiftly. The science vessel Odyssey was equipped with, and would be the first to test this new marvellous piece of engineering. In the year 2200, they did just that. As they approached what would be dubbed the Hyperlane, their hyperdrive began to engage spinning up its colossal flux capacitors, and in an explosion of energy surged them almost four light years in a matter of minutes. The Odyssey had arrived in Alpha Centauri undamaged, and the United Nations of Earth had arrived on the galactic stage. My lords, now we shall move on to two post faster than light travel events worthy of exploration. One for the United Nations of Earth, and one for ourselves, the Commonwealth. Both remind us that the galaxy is in fact quite the dystopian experience. Both of humanity's factions had made it into the stars and were readily exploring, establishing observation posts and colonizing other worlds. Soon after the Commonwealth began interstellar exploration, a science vessel managed to isolate a residual iron trail in the Rigel system that was identical to the one produced by the Chrysanthemum's engines. It was likely to have originated from one of the other great arc vessels. Although the faint iron trail was over a century old, we managed to track it on an outbound trajectory towards a previously uncharted star system. Soon after, the Ark ship was located, in a stable orbit of a colossal gas giant. Although in orbit it was without power, no distress beacon had been activated, and an armed boarding party was sent on board to establish what had happened to the vessel. The boarding party returned from the vessel that we understood to be the Hyacinth, with a gruesome report. Human remains, in the amounts consistent with the Ark ship's entire complement of a quarter of a million colonists, were found on board. 
Most seem to have died from starvation, but there were also signs of small arms fire and cannibalism. Had circumstances been different, it could very well have been the chrysanthemum drifting like a silent tomb. A sobering reminder of the dangers we face in a cold and uncaring universe. The years since the United Nations of Earth have been exploring the stars have also not been without incident. One of their colonies, Europa 7 in the Vagar system, once a flourishing and model world in their domain, was attacked by an unknown alien race only designated by the UNE as the Gamma Aliens. We have several recordings of the events that occurred. I shall play them for you now. Know that I did what I could to protect you. All personnel, man your battle station. Enemy ships approaching. I solemnly swear to devote my life and abilities in defense of the United Nations of Earth. To defend the Constitution of Man and to further the universal rights of all sentient life. From the depths of the Pacific to the edge of the galaxy for as long as I shall live. that Colony Europa 7 has in fact been destroyed by an un- The estimated death toll is in the billions. My entire family was- The attackers are being called Gamma Aliens until more information With is- With this attack, we have no choice but to protect our kind by unleashing our almighty weapon upon them, summoning the apocalypse. As you saw and heard, Europa 7 was completely destroyed, and the subsequent war is costing the UNE dearly. As we understand it, they continue to battle with these Gamma Aliens. We are, as of yet, deciding whether or not we should give assistance, although as of yet they've also not formally requested it. I would be interested to hear your thoughts on the matter. And that brings an end to this report. Let me know in the comments what other topics you want to hear about, and if you want to hear me interview the Stellaris game director Eladrin about the upcoming DLC First Contact, please click the video on screen now.